and my name is Becky O'Sullivan. I work at the FPAN Center at USF in Tampa. Um, this presentation is based on a paper that I co-wrote with my colleague, Eric Prendergast, uh, who works for Cardno. And Cardno is a, a private archaeology firm. So they do um, they do projects uh, before like a cons you know construction happens to check that no um, sites are going to be impacted and um, so that sort of thing. So um, a bit different than where I work, which is more on the kind of public outreach sort of side. So um, this whole project has been a partnership between our FPAN Center at USF and, and Cardno to do this work and to, um, to put together the information about Zion and, and what happened there. Um, so also just wanted to start and say that um, I'm not going to be showing any pictures of human remains in this presentation, just so everyone is aware. Um, and also um, no human remains were removed from the site or disturbed during the project. And that was a really important part of um, the kind of research design and plan that we put together. So I do have some pictures of objects that are um, came were grave related. So some coffin hardware and objects that were um, in the burials, but no object, no pictures of human remains. So to kind of start this off, um, you know, the city of Tampa, uh, maybe not everyone is even in Florida right now. That's the kind of beauty of these Zoom talks. But so Tampa is on Florida's Gulf Coast, about halfway down. Um, and it's one of, you know, the bigger cities in the state of Florida. And so Tampa today really likes to present itself as this kind of sunshine soaked place of tourism. We just, you know, the Tampa Bay Lightning uh, <laughs> just won the Stanley Cup, you know, so you might have um, heard of Tampa for that. Um, but, you know, another kind of way that Tampa likes to present itself is as this um, really diverse city that um, values that diversity and that history. So if you've ever been to Tampa, you've probably been to Ybor City, which is the historic um, cigar making um, part of, of the town where there are a lot of Latin immigrants who came to work in the cigar factories. Vicente Martinez Ybor is, you know, can really be credited with making Tampa what it is today. So that kind of aspect of Tampa's history gets really um, played up. But the real history of Tampa is something that um, is not so, you know, sunshiny. Um, it's, it's a history that's really steeped in erasure and removal, going back to its founding as Fort Brook, which was um, a, a concentration camp and a place of removal for Seminole tribal members that um, once stood where downtown Tampa is now located today. So, you know, much like this painful history that we have with Fort Brook, um, there have also been attempts to erase the history of Tampa's Black pioneers through many different aspects of institutional racism. Um, so that led to the destruction of Black spaces and communities and um, places of Black history. And so this, through this systemic anti-Black racism tied to segregation, annexation, taxation, urban renewal, gentrification, housing discrimination, um, and municipal neglect, um, Zion Cemetery, which I'm going to talk about this evening, was erased from the landscape of Tampa um, in this way and, and for these reasons. But um, what I'm gonna talk about as well is the fact that despite all of this, it was Zion Cemetery was never erased from the memories of Tampa's black community. And fortunately today, we have the opportunity to put it back on the map of Tampa and to really highlight the stories and the resilience of the people who made Zion Cemetery and who made um, the city of Tampa what it is today. So that's really what I'm gonna focus on um, in this presentation. So I really like to start this talk um, talking about Zion and 
by showing this map that you see here. So um, this is a picture of a Sanborn fire insurance map. And so if anyone on this call, if you've ever done any kind of, um, you know, historical research or genealogy research, Sanborn maps are fantastic for seeing um, what cities look like over time. And Sanborns are very cool because they don't just show like the big main buildings um, on these maps, they show every structure and every part of the city. So if you go to a library, um, sometimes you can actually go see the actual old Sanborn maps that are still like in a paper book that are, um, so it's like a huge book with all these pages that show the different parts of the city. And so back in the day when they would update these every couple of years, um, they wouldn't send the library, the archive, like a whole new page to put in this book. They would send um, pieces of paper that the archivist or the librarian would then like cut out actually and physically paste onto the, the page of the book. And so that's what you're seeing here. So this is um, a 1950s Sanborn um, with 1950s editions that you can see that have been pasted onto the spot. And this picture is um, so appropriate because this area shows the location of where Zion Cemetery um, was. But it doesn't look like that, right? What we have here are pieces of paper that have been pasted on top of it that show these blue buildings here, which are now the Robles Park Village Apartments. So just like with the Sanborn map, we have these newer layers that are pasted on top of these existing landscapes that are beneath the surface. So in this Sanborn, we have these layers that show this 1950s landscape that's pasted on top of another landscape that still exists and is beneath the surface and that's Zion Cemetery. And so the work of the archeology span related you know, to this project is to very carefully peel back those layers so that we can reveal what was there and what has been there the whole time, which is Zion. So um, for those of you who uh, aren't, you know, don't know where Zion Cemetery is located, um, this is a map, an aerial view of the city of Tampa. Um, you can see this is downtown here. And if we go straight up Florida Avenue from downtown, um, you will get to Zion Cemetery, right up here. So this whole story starts, well, the whole story of refinding this place really starts with um, this guy that you see here, Ray Reed. Um, he's a, a local um, historian and cemetery researcher, um, just an all around uh, great guy. Um, and so a couple of years ago, well, he started um, researching another cemetery in the city of Tampa, the, um, the indigent cemetery, uh, the pauper cemetery, um, which had a lot of issues with how it was being cared for. Um, there were a lot of headstones that were missing. So he started looking through old death certificates to look for the names of people who were buried there. So as he is doing this, um, he starts to come across all these death certificates that say Zion Cemetery. So this is a cemetery that, you know, it says it's in Tampa. Um, but, you know, if you look at a map of Tampa today, there's no cemetery that was called Zion Cemetery. So where is this place? Um, through a series of very serendipitous events, which has happened a lot on this project, um, Ray got in touch with Paul Guzzo, who you see on the left here. Um, he's a reporter for the Tampa Bay Times. Um, his kind of beat is all things uh, vintage Tampa Bay. So he reports on a lot of um, kind of interesting um, history stories and that sort of a thing in the Tampa Bay area. So Paul was interviewing Ray for a totally different story. And Ray's like, you know, this is all well and good. Like, I'll do the interview. But the real story is 
Zion Cemetery, what happened to Zion. Um, and, you know, Paul, um, you know, he got some information from Ray about it, but, you know, he didn't really know, um, what do I do with this story? Is this like a real thing? Like, is it possible that a cemetery can go missing? Like, is this even a real place? And so he, he really wanted to kind of write it off. But his partner, um, James Borchuk, who you see here, really um, kind of needled him to, to keep going and to, to look into it um, a little bit more. And thankfully he did, because that's, you know, what really, what, really what got the, the ball rolling with this whole project. So Paul's first stop was the Tampa Bay History Center, which has a fantastic map collection. Um, and they, I think just this past year, they've digitized a lot of their maps. So it's called the Luna Collection. So if you Google Tampa Bay History Center Luna Collection, you can see scans of um, so, like amazing maps from all over Florida um, that are all archived with the History Center. So definitely check that out. But so Paul goes to the History Center and the um, head curator, Rodney Kite Powell, finds this plat map for Zion Cemetery. This is what you're looking at here. So um, it was filed in February of 1901. It has 98 family plots, which are these squares that you see here, which are mostly 20 by 20 feet in size. And each one of these would have held multiple graves. There's also a potter's field that's marked out in the northeast corner. And the cemetery covers about 2.5 acres. It also includes um, a legal description of the, where the cemetery is located. You can see here it says Florida Avenue. Um, that's on there. But, um, you know, if you go to this area on Florida Avenue, there's no cemetery. So what happened? Was the cemetery moved? Um, you know, what, what happened to this place? So Paul was looking for more information. Um, he reached out to the Florida Division of Historical Resources up in Tallahassee, and they recommended for him to contact our FPAN Center um, at USF. So Paul reached out to us in fall of 2018. Um, and, you know, I, checking my email that day and I get this email from Paul and it's like, I think that there might be a cemetery that's lost. How can I figure this out? It's like, okay, <laughs> what are we gonna do with this? So the first thing that we did was to take that plat map that he got from Rodney and to put it into some mapping software so we can figure out where it lays out on the actual landscape of Tampa today. So that's what you're looking at here. So using, um, you know, ArcGIS, it's a, a kind of fancy computer mapping program. We can actually overlay the map um, and put it to scale and figure out where it's located. So as you can see, where it's overlaid, we have warehouses, buildings, roads, um, apartment buildings, but no cemetery. Um, and, you know, so the footprint of where this cemetery looked like it was located was actually across three different property owners. One was Tampa Housing Authority, which you see here in orange. Another was Richard Gonsmart. And if you've ever spent any time in Tampa, you probably have heard that name before. Um, he is part of a, a big uh, restaurant owning family here in Tampa. He owns the, um, he owns, you know, like a, a bunch of different restaurants um, that are here in town. So it's a very well-to-do family. And then another small um, property here that's on a, a tow lot. So the cemetery is now, you know, covered with this kind of tangle of roads and different properties and utilities. Um, that really kind of complicate the picture of what happened here. So the history of this area um, is goes back much farther than even um, established in 1901. 
So this area um, that you can see here in blue was known as the Robles Pond neighborhood. And so this was a historic um, African-American neighborhood that was just outside the boundaries of the city of Tampa. And it was established um, you know, sometime in the late 1800s. Um, there was a, a school, as you can see in this picture here, multiple churches, homes. Um, so this was a real self-sufficient Black community that was just to the north of um, what was then, you know, the boundaries of the city of Tampa. So um, into this kind of community, into this story um, comes Richard Doby, and he's the founder of Zion Cemetery. So he purchased the land that became Zion in 1894 from Isaac Warner, who was a white homesteader, who was the original homesteader for that area. And he bought the property 2.5 acres for $110. Um, Mr. Doby is a really interesting figure in Tampa history that um, hasn't gotten a lot of, um, you know, recognition um, over the years, but he was a, a business owner. He owned you know, multiple businesses. He was also a property developer. He started um, several black neighborhoods, one of which was called Dobieville, which is in South Tampa. Um, and he's originally from Archer, Florida, which is up in Alachua County. Um, and Archer, Florida also has a really deep history as a, an African-American um, kind of farming community after the Civil War. So he grew up there and then came to Tampa, started his own businesses, started his own communities, um, and then started his own cemetery in the form of Zion Cemetery. So, um, you know, one question that I hear people ask sometimes is like, well, why do we have, you know, black cemeteries and white cemeteries? Why do we have, you know, some cemeteries that are just for African Americans? And the answer is pretty obvious. Um, it's because of segregation. So in 1896, we have the Plessy versus Ferguson decision that codifies into law um, segregation, the segregation of the races. And so that segregation in the places people are living, eating, praying, going to school, and also in the places that people are being buried. And so um, this, you know, this segregation and um, these kind of Jim Crow laws, even in the grave, people are separated. And so in the city of Tampa, um, the oldest cemetery we have in the city of Tampa is Oaklawn Cemetery. And that was established in the 1850s. Um, and so that cemetery is internally segregated, but um, we, there are sections that are white, black, and Catholic all within the same cemetery. But as we get into the late 1800s, we, say, we see that that is you know, no longer practiced in these cemeteries. So um, all the cemeteries that the city of Tampa owns, the historic cemeteries, that were established in the late 1800s and the early 1900s served the white population of Tampa. The black population of Tampa had to make their own spaces to bury their dead because the city would not provide a place for them to lay their loved ones to rest. And so that's why we see these black cemeteries um, formed uh, around this time. So, um, like I said, Mr. Doby established a cemetery um, in 1901. It gets platted out. Um, and a few years later, in 1907, he sells the cemetery to um, a, a corporation it's called Florida Industrial and Commercial, which was a Black-owned corporation that made coffins and furniture. One of the board members of this corporation was C.W. Patterson, who was um, a an undertaker in the city of Tampa at this time. So I just, um, I love this picture. This is a newspaper ad from 1915 for Mr. Patterson's undertaking company. Um, and you can see it says it's the, um, 
the oldest black undertaking parlor in the city of Tampa. And it also includes this great picture of him. And this is really one of the only pictures that we have of um, one of the people associated with the cemetery. Um, you know, despite Mr. Doby's prominence, we don't have any pictures, you know, of what he looked like, which is very unfortunate. Um, so Mr. Patterson buried a lot of the people who were buried in Zion Cemetery. He also buried his own baby son in Zion Cemetery, according to the death certificates that we found. So, you know, he was a very important person in the, in the community of Robles Pond and of Tampa, and very important to the, the history of the cemetery. So one of the other things that we see with Zion Cemetery is um, you know, from the very beginning of when it was established, we almost immediately see attempts by, um, you know, white people in Tampa, different property owners and officials to try to take this cemetery away from the Black community. So um, the picture you see here, this is um, JJ Head, he was the tax collector for Hillsborough County, um, and he was also a former a Confederate veteran. And so, like I said, he was a tax collector, and he, one of the things he did was go around and buy up the tax deeds on delinquent properties throughout Hillsborough County. So in 1903, he buys up the tax deed um, for Zion Cemetery, even though they don't owe any taxes because it's a cemetery. He buys up this tax deed. And in, 20, in 1912, he takes the, the coffin that owns the cemetery to court to try to take the cemetery from them. And so that's what this um, newspaper article that you see here is referencing. So in 1912, like I said, he goes to court. The judge initially rules in his favor because the judge says that he is not aware that any cemetery exists there, which is ridiculous because the judge is Judge Robles, who lived probably a mile away from the cemetery. Um, so he initially grants the cemetery land to Mr. Head. Um, but we know that something, something must have trip that up for him because the cemetery continued to be owned by the coffin company and people continued to be buried there. But that part of it didn't make it into the newspaper. So a few years later um, in 1915, Zion was again under threat when it was due to go to auction on the courthouse steps as part of a bankruptcy case against that coffin company that owned it. Um, but you know the historical documents they're unclear beyond this point as to what happened but um, between the 196 between this 1916 map and the early 1920s that you can see here um, we do see a reduction in the footprint of the cemetery so this um, this map is from 1916 you can see florida avenue um, this is the footprint of the cemetery you see it's marked as a cemetery um, this is the, the location of the school, that same picture that I showed you before. And then when we move forward into the 1920s, we see that this front part of the cemetery that fronts on Florida Avenue has been lopped off. Um, this part here is an, actually is a Catholic cemetery that was farther to the south. So we know that something happened during this time, but it's unclear um, exactly what. So on this 1922 Sanborn, you see the same thing. So we see the cemetery property here, but this front part that fronts on Florida Avenue has been lopped off. And now it's a, a separate um, parcel that's separate from the cemetery. But this Sanborn is also really cool because we can see that there were several churches that were um, around the cemetery, all the little houses that made up the Robles Pond neighborhood. Um, so we get, you know, this picture of this black community that was here, um, you know, in the early 20th century. So the real kind of um, death knell for this cemetery happened in 1923. And that's when the city of Tampa annexed um, land 
to include Zion Cemetery within the city of Tampa. So on this map here, you can see this line here, this was the original city boundaries in 1922. And then um, this other line here that goes all the way up to the Hillsborough River um, and includes Zion Cemetery is the new land that was um, then annexed into the city. And so this was kind of a double-edged sword because once this area became part of the city, it did mean that there were more um, utilities and amenities that were brought in, um, like sewers, paving the roads and that sort of a thing. But it also meant um, that taxes were increased dramatically on property owners on this newly annexed land. And also it increased pressure from um, gentrification and new people moving into these, you know, historic rural communities and areas that had been outside of the city limits. So this leads to, in 1926, a white businessman, H.P. Kennedy, um, actually ends up purchasing Zion Cemetery property from the heir of the original homesteader, Isaac Warner. So it's unclear how Isaac Warner's heir got this property um, somehow. It, um, through some kind of machinations, um, Alice Fuller gets the Zion Cemetery property and sells it to H.P. Kennedy for a dollar. And H.P. Kennedy is a developer. Um, and so, you know, he buys this property, then he goes to the city council for the city of Tampa, and he applies to have all the back taxes uh, waived for the property because he said it's a cemetery and it shouldn't have any taxes to pay on it. A few months later, he goes back to the city council and he applies for a building permit so that he can build a, a, new, um, a new building on the property. Um, and so that's what you see here. This is the Sanborn map from 1931. This building that you see here in pink, it's a brick structure with different um, shop fronts that still exist to this day in this spot. And so, you know, like I said, H.P. Kennedy um, built these buildings on here. And that um, is, you know, the last that we see in terms of mentions of Zion Cemetery. So even on this map, you can see that the, the shape of the parcel, it still kind of mirrors that footprint of the cemetery that we remember from the plat. But now there's no mention of a cemetery. There are houses and there's a storefront. Um, that's there. And that's, that's really the turning point when the cemetery is erased. So looking at another kind of form of um, information that we have for this, we, we have over 700 death certificates for people who are buried at Zion Cemetery, which are just a wealth of information about um, the people that were buried there and their lives um, and the, the kind of, um, you know, a view into the community that, that created this cemetery. Um, but we can also see, you know, how many people were buried at the cemetery for every year. So, um, you know, 1910 is when we start to see pretty reliable death certificates in the state of Florida. So we don't really have any before then. So we have 25 for that year. But then moving forward, you see between 1911 and 1918, we have, you know, um, close to, you know, 100 people that are buried there each year. And then in 1919, the number declined steeply. So I think we're all aware of what happened in 1919, right? That was the flu pandemic that happened. And so in many of the cemeteries across the country, we see um, you know, a huge number of people that are dying and being buried in cemeteries at this time. So we would expect to see the same thing with Zion, but instead we see the number sharply decline. And the last burial that we see is in 1923, which coincides with that annexation into the city of Tampa. So, you know, after the cemetery is been erased by H.B. Kennedy building on top of it, 
this area, you know, it's, it's still a neighborhood. Um, we have increasing um, pressure on the, the black residents um, and, you know, gentrification happen, happening. There's a, a chicken farm that's on part of the property, like in the 30s and 40s, all these different things that are kind of going on. But 1951 um, is really when we see the next big chapter in the kind of Zion story. So following World War II, the Housing Authority um, applied to the Federal Public Housing Administration to fund a program of urban renewal and slum clearance um, and the construction of new housing developments. And Robles Park Village, which still stands to this day, was uh, financed in 1950. And it would have been the fifth public housing project in Tampa. Um, but so the decision to bulldoze this predominantly, still predominantly black Robles Pond neighborhood in order to build what was planned to be a segregated whites only apartment complex um, led to a lot of unrest and outcry, uh, understandably from the black community at that time. The displaced families were not compensated to relocate it, to relocate. And in response, the housing authority seized many of the neighborhood's parcels by eminent domain. Ultimately, the Tampa NAACP sought support from its Atlanta and Washington DC offices to bring lawsuits against the Tampa Housing Authority, but the Housing Authority succeeded in building these whites only housing projects, even after the discovery of human remains during the construction. So that's what you're looking at here is a, a picture of the Robles Park Village, which is this Housing Authority um, public housing project that was built over the Robles Pond neighborhood. So in 91, like I said, when they're building these apartment buildings, three caskets were unearthed um, when they were digging the footers for one of the buildings. And that's what you see here. So these are fragments of the caskets. One of the caskets had a small plaque on it that said, our darling. And all three of the caskets were child size and only 15 inches beneath the surface of the ground. Um, so this, you know, find it made the papers, um, as you can see here. Um, and, you know, the city officials at the time found out that the property had once been Zion Cemetery. People from the community came forward and said, yes, this is where the cemetery used to be. Um, but they, the city officials said that when the property was sold in 1925, the new owners had agreed to remove all the bodies. And so, you know, um, they kind of, you know, even though these three coffins were unearthed, they decided that um, there's no way that they could find any more graves. And minutes from the Tampa Housing Authority Board at that time um, also revealed that there was really little concern from THA at that time um, for the potential cemetery and that they decided that construction could continue and, um, you know, that they shouldn't worry anymore about any um, graves that could be beneath the ground at this site. So the apartments, um, like I said, still stand to this day and they've changed very little since their construction in the 1950s. Now Robles Park is a predominantly African-American neighborhood, whereas when it was built, um, it was only for whites. And so its buildings are now the oldest and the least updated in the housing authority stock. So now today, a low-income African-American community lives inside housing units that were intended to exclude them and built on top of a stolen neighborhood, stolen African-American neighborhood and erased graves of um, African-Americans who made the city of Tampa what it is today. And so that's kind of um, the background on, you know, how this all came to be. So figuring all this out, um, in June of 2019, Paul Guzzo published his story. And talking to him, he said it's been, it was, the most nervous that he's ever been um, publishing a story because he was like, you know, what happens if the story comes out and then someone comes forward and they say that, you know, 
it didn't exist or it was somewhere else or something like that. Um, and he was kind of um, partially right on that uh, because when the story was published, someone did come forward who remembered the cemetery. Um, Mrs. Yumi Massey, she's 96 years old. Um, and Mrs. Massey lived in the 1930s in the house that you see here that was backed up to Zion Cemetery. And she remembered um, as a little girl growing up there in the 30s that one day a group of workers um, came when in trucks and with heavy equipment and started to dig up some of the graves in the cemetery. Um, and, you know, they were excavating the graves. They weren't doing it in a very respectful or careful way. She said that the grave shafts were left open at night and over the weekend and, um, you know, kids in the neighborhood would jump down into the holes um, and, you know, find trinkets and things that were in the graves that there were, um, you know, uh, teeth and pieces of bone that were strewn on the ground surface. And so from her story, it was clear that, you know, it, this is not any removal that did happen. It was not done in a careful or um, respectful way. So also, you know, when the story broke, um, you know, it had real world implications. The cemetery is on land that people are living on right now um, that's still owned by Tampa Housing Authority. But thankfully, the housing authority has changed a lot since the 1950s. Um, and, you know, their response was um, led by THA Senior Vice President Leroy Moore, um, who you can see here. And when the story came to light, Mr. Moore and his colleagues went back and read those 1950s minutes from the housing authority and learned that the discovery of these three caskets had been dismissed out of hand at that time um, by the housing authority at that time. And um, Mr. Moore felt that, you know, the housing authority could undo what it had done back then and make it right. And very, from the very beginning, he envisioned that Zion would be restored as a final resting place and historic memorial, that all the properties that make up Zion would be brought together and that it would be a memorial and a cemetery again, where the people who are buried there could remain at rest um, in perpetuity. So Mr. Moore immediately contacted one of the housing authorities consultants, which is Cardno, and began to work with their archaeologists to plan for the archaeological survey and management of Zion Cemetery. Um, but Mr. Moore knew he would also need to build a committee to guide the process, um, whether you know there was anyone buried beneath the footprint of the apartments or not. So the housing authority is very good at um, doing this kind of consultation because it's what they do on a daily basis at least the housing authority of today. So um, the Mr. Moore brought together um, for the committee, leaders of the Robles Park Resident Council, president of the local um, NAACP, local activists, um, Robles Park residents, um, housing authority caseworkers, board members and staff. And then he later invited members of um, Tampa's government, FPAN staff, and even state lawmakers um, and historians to, to join the committee. And every meeting was totally open um, to the press. Um, and so everything was done in a very um, open and transparent way. So um, luckily Tampa has a very <laughs> small archeological community. So, um, our FPAN Center and Cardinal, um, you know, pulled together um, and, and we really did the project as a team. And as Mr. Moore would later say during a speech that he gave at the rededication for the cemetery, um, you know, this is what it feels like to be part of a movement. And I think that, you know, I can safely speak for everyone on this committee that we all really felt like um, we were part of 
something um, bigger and all really try to, to do our part to work together to, to come to a good, um, a good conclusion with this project. So this, um, this project, it wasn't just like a regular archaeological survey, you know, we're um, out in the woods or, you know, no one is too worried about what we're doing, right? We're looking for a cemetery that's on land that people are living on. So when we were designing our GPR, ground penetrating radar survey, we really took that into account. We, um, so as you can see, the, the first areas that we surveyed, um, the yellow was the first areas because they are within the um, expected footprint of the cemetery. But we also expanded our GPR way out, outside of the boundaries because we wanted to give peace of mind to the people who were still living um, in Robles Park Village. So, um, you know, to accomplish this, Cardno has um, a multi-array, really fancy Stream C GPR unit. Um, that's really good for seeing beneath pavement and complex utilities. Our FPAN Center has um, also has a GPR unit, a SIR 3000, which you can see in the picture here, um, which is really good for getting up in little areas. So we used it um, to do that. Um, and so we were also able to overlap these two methods in much of the areas of the cemetery so that we can get kind of um, two method, you know, verification in our survey. And that was very helpful in trying to figure out what was going on um, with the, the results that we were getting. Uh, the, so this is um, the results for one of the areas that you can see here. Um, this is a, a GPR survey that is between two of the buildings. Um, and this is at about 140 centimeters beneath the surface. The white rectangles that you see here, they're, um, you know, the size and shape of a grave. They're oriented east-west. They're at the depth that we would expect for a burial. Um, you can see so these are all um, graves that are still there beneath the surface in this area, which was once the, the pauper cemetery. And so the results were uh, very powerful and emotional when we shared them with the, the committee. Um, and you know, some of the members had to get up and leave the room um, because it was it was so emotional. Um, and so in this this first part of the survey, we learned that there were at least 127 burials that were in these areas that we surveyed beneath the grass and the sidewalks and the roads of Robles Park Village. So since then, we've gone back and done lots of more GPR. So every area that you see in green are areas that we surveyed. So we surveyed all the open accessible areas um, on the THA property. We also surveyed all the areas on Mr. Gonsmart's property and all the area of the um, expected you know, cemetery on this, um, this third property right here. And so I think the final count is over 300 graves um, that we were able to locate with the GPR um, through you know one of the one of the GPR methods. The Stream C guys from Cardno also have a GPR that they can pull behind their car and they surveyed down Florida Avenue and were able to determine that there are no graves that go out into Florida Avenue, which was very good. Um, so, you know, when the news broke um, that we had found um, evidence of burials that were on the property, um, you know, that was really um, another blow to the, the people who were living here because now, you know, they know that they're living on top of a cemetery. And it's one thing if you choose to live next to a cemetery, but you know, if you wake up one morning and read the paper and find out that one is literally, literally in your backyard, that's a completely different thing. 
So immediately, THA went into action to move the 28 families that were living within the footprint of Zion Cemetery um, and to relocate them to the homes of their choosing. And this was really spearheaded by um, Reva and Clark, who are the president and vice president of the Residence Council. Um, and they did an amazing job of working with the residents to help them find um, a new place to live. So the residents had the choice to live somewhere else in Robles. They could go to another THA property in Tampa, or they can get a Section 8 housing voucher to go to a place of their choice. And now all those families have relocated to um, much better housing. And um, that, that's a really good part of the story. Also, as part of all of this, um, you know, there is a lot of um, outreach, kind of informal outreach that we did in the community as we were doing the GPR. Um, we talked a lot with the residents who were living there in the different apartments. I can't tell you how many people we talked to who said, oh yeah, I always knew there was a cemetery here. My grandfather, grandmother always used to tell me that Robles is built on a cemetery. So, um, you know, getting to talk to the residents and tell them about what we were doing and show them the equipment that we're using. You can see one of the a little kids, he just got off the bus and I'm showing him how the, the GPR works um, was really great. And then also, um, there were banners put up around the cemetery once we knew, you know, the, the kind of boundaries that had information about the history of the cemetery and also the names of all the people who were buried there, which was um, really nice to see. So that part of, you know, the part of the story of Zion, it's easy to think of it as this is kind of like a really sad and tragic story and the things that happened to Zion, the things that were purposefully done to Zion are horrible, but the story of Zion is really the people who are buried there and that story is um, a really beautiful one and inspiring and the names of the people, um, the people who are buried there, you know, they, they have a story to tell um, that is important to understanding this kind of full history of Tampa. So, you know, for some of the people we have um, obituaries. Uh, this one is for LG Caro. He was very prominent um, pastor in Tampa. Um, I think the his um, obituary says that he probably married more people in the city of Tampa than anyone else. Um, so, you know, with each one of these that we find, we're, we're piecing together all these stories and, and history that, that um, we can learn from and appreciate. We can also go back to those um, death certificates, like I said, and get a picture of, um, you know, what was the population of the cemetery like, you know? Um, so you can see that um, 194 of the people who are buried in the cemetery were stillborn or very young infants under the age of one year. Um, so there's a, a large percentage of the cemetery population that were very, very um, young infants or children. But there's also, you know, people who were buried there who lived into their 80s and 90s. Uh, from the death certificates, we can also figure out the place of birth for the people who are buried there. The majority of the people buried at Zion are um, from born in uh, Florida or Tampa, but we also have people from born in Georgia, South Carolina, other parts of the South. There is even, you know, um, a pretty you know decent number of people who are born in the Bahamas or the West Indies. So, um, you know, this gives us a really cool window into seeing the, um, the diversity within the community of Zion Cemetery in this kind of part of Tampa um, in itself. So a few months ago, um, I took the project to the next step, which was doing some ground truthing and verification of the, um, the things we were seeing with the GPR so that we can figure out where are the actual boundaries of the cemetery and make sure that there are no 
graves that were outside of what we thought the boundaries were. So there are three areas that we tested um, that you can see that are marked in yellow here. So these two are on the edge of the cemetery so that we can, like I said, figure out is this the actual boundary of the cemetery or does it extend out from that? Um, and then this third area here, which I'll talk about last. So um, Cardinal obviously took the lead on um, all of this. And so they used um, heavy equipment, you can see here, um, to very carefully strip back the surface of the ground here in very small increments. Um, until we started to see evidence of the, the grave shafts or the actual holes that were um, dug and then filled in again when the, the individual was buried there. So we were using the GPR data, we were able to mark out the locations that we were expecting to see burials. Um, and that was very helpful when we were then doing that ground truth thing. So in this aerial view, you can see the area has been completely um, stripped of the kind of top of the soil. And if you look really carefully, you can see these areas of different colored, really mixed up soil. And those are the grave shafts um, for the, the burials that are there. So you can kind of see them a bit better here. So these areas of mixed up soil. So just imagine that you're, you're digging a hole in your backyard Right, there's different colors of soil sometimes when you're digging, you dig the hole, that dirt that you dug out is mixed up in a pile to the side. Then when you fill it back in, the soil is gonna look different in that hole that you filled in. And that's what we're looking for. Um, so much of archeology span is really looking at the dirt, not the actual artifacts or the things that we're, we're looking for, but the dirt can, um, the soils and the, the ways that um, soils were changing over time can a lot. So um, you can see here, this is the last row of graves at the edge of the cemetery um, that are these really modeled and mixed up areas. And in this area, we were able to, um, to verify uh, one of the graves by digging down by hand very slowly just to the top of the coffin so that we can verify that there were still human remains that were there, but no human remains were um, disturbed or removed at any point in this. We just went down very carefully, verified, and then um, covered it back up. And we also, you know, pulled it back way farther than the edge of the cemetery. So you can see here there's 30 feet of um, area without any of those um, grave shafts, those changes in soil color. Um, so we definitely found the edge of the cemetery. So in this grave, um, you know, this was the area that was supposed to be the pauper cemetery. So when you think of a pauper cemetery, you think of people who are buried maybe in a shroud or a very plain coffin. But what we found was actually pretty different. These are thumb screws. They're actual metal screws that were decorative that were used to hold the top of the coffin on. So like I said, these are um, pretty decorative. They're not something you would expect for someone who is born or buried without any you know, money or means. Um, and this um, grave also had a, a plate glass um, viewing, um, a viewing glass that was in the coffin. So that's like another kind of fancier feature um, that was you know, for, this, for this burial. So that really kind of, um, changed how we thought about this part of the cemetery. So the next area that we looked at was um, down in this corner here. And, um, you know, in this area, we're able to also verify the edge of the cemetery. And also in some of the burials, we were able to find grave offerings that were um, left with the individuals. So. Um, glass vases and shells um, left with some of the burials. And the shells are really significant because um, this is something that we were really looking for because it's an African-American cemetery. And this is a very well-known burial practice that we see in other African-American cemeteries in the South um, and in the Caribbean, also in the kind of Gullah Geechee um, 
coastal Florida and kind of Georgia Carolinas area, um, shells are often left as offerings on the grave because um, of their association with water and the, the afterlife. And so these shells are, um, you know, a kind of symbol of um, their loved one making that journey uh, across the water back home to the land of the ancestors. And so these are really powerful objects that we're able to find and document and then put back with the, the grave of the, the person that they, they came from. So the final area, um, you can see that this Operation 3 over here. This part was much more, um, the GPR was kind of much more ambiguous about what we would see here. Um, and that's what we were seeing in the, in the ground as well. So you can see on this area, we were starting to find the grave shafts much higher up. You can see it, um, you can see that in the wall here. But in this part, they were looking really different. They were much larger. They didn't show up till really far down. And we we're trying to figure out what was going on. Um, and what we found out was that those ones that were much deeper, these are examples of graves that were removed, like Mrs. Massey remembered from her childhood. So here you can see the stain from that grave shaft. And this is pretty much at the bottom of it. We went down a few more centimeters and it totally petered out. But what we also found um, were objects that were also left on that grave in the form of these really beautiful queen conch shells, um, which are not native to this part of Florida. Um, and so these are probably from the Bahamas or Caribbean. So we think back to those, that graph that I had of, you know, where people were from. Um, we do have, you know, some Bahamians and people from um, the West, you know, West Indies, Caribbean. And so um, we see that reflected in these offerings, these objects that uh, were left with this grave, which was another really powerful thing to find that despite everything, um, you know, the voices of these people and their loved ones from the past are still coming through in these objects that were left behind. So, um, you know, if we looked at a map of Tampa's black cemeteries in 2018, or it's cemeteries in general, not just black cemeteries, it would look something like this. And you see these red squares that are right here. But Zion's really opened a door um, to kind of look for these other places that have been erased. And today, there are many more cemeteries that are coming to light. Zion, Port Tampa, Ridgewood, um, and cemeteries on the, the other side of Tampa Bay and Pinellas County too. And this is all, you know, um, part of this um, bigger kind of movement. Um, and I think it's just really summed up so eloquently by Fred Hearns, who's a a Tampa historian and a U.S. anthropology PhD student, and he was um, interviewed for the Tampa Bay Times, you know, about all this, and he said, but you can't hide the truth. It will be dug up. Those young people out on the streets inherited our rage, and until we tell the whole truth, there will always be a lingering evil waiting to pop its head up. So when it comes to these cemeteries, you know, these are examples of horrible things that were done in the past, but they are also symptomatic of systems, racist systems that still continue to this day. And so when we learn the history of Zion Cemetery and these other places, we can also learn the history of the anti-Black racism and these systems that continue today. And we can educate people so that we can try to break those down and, um, and really uh, heal and come together as a community which is so important. So now that the um, most of the archeological work is done, um, uh, kind of moving forward are, you know, THA's plans to make Zion into a memorial to bring all these properties back together. And recently, Dr. Antoinette Jackson, who is a professor at um, USF and the anthropology department, and she's also our new department chair, um, was awarded a, a, a big grant from uh, the University of South Florida um, 
through you know a bunch of money that they were giving out um, for projects related to um, combating anti-Black racism in the kind of Tampa community. Um, so Dr. Jackson got um, this big grant and she and um, Mr. Hearns and her students are going to be working on um, a project to, to do a lot of oral histories and talking to the community about really piecing together this history of Zion and the community, which is gonna be really important for um, the next steps of making the memorial, which is so important. So I just wanna end by thanking um, my you know, colleagues at Cardno, residents of Robles Park Village, um, and everyone else who has worked so hard to really um, make this project what it is.